Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. In the midst of an ongoing pandemic, the United States and South Carolina have been reacting to the death of George Floyd, an unarmed black man who was killed by a white police officer in Minneapolis. There have been protests across the state and country, some peaceful and some not. We talk with U.S. Senator Tim Scott and Columbia Mayor Steve Benjamin about these protests, police brutality, and how the country and state moves forward. Thousands of people gathered at the South Carolina State House Saturday to protest the death of George Floyd, the unarmed black man who was killed in police custody in Minneapolis by a white police officer who knelt on his neck for more than eight minutes on May 25th. At the State House, there were signs, including one that read, Please, I can't breathe. The words George Floyd uttered as he slowly died, his final moments captured on video, have led to widespread condemnation, worldwide protests, and violent altercations, as well as important dialogue. I'm sick and tired of people killing us, honestly. Once I saw George Floyd die, that was that was way different than every everything else, honestly. It made me realize I can be the next person. My father can be the next person. My brother can my twin brother can be the next person. If my boyfriend, anybody. And we're not free yet. We never will be free. We will always be roped up and chained and murdered because of the the way that my skin is. Well, first of all, I go to USC Columbia, so this is my community, and I want to do what's right and speak out what I believe. And also, I have a brother who is half black, and I see what he has to go through when I'm with him and how we get treated differently when he's with us, and it's not right, and I want to stand up for that. Well, it's just, it seems like, you know, we, we try and take steps forward and then all of a sudden things happen to make the culture seem to stay, take a step back. You know, uh, that is what I have seen, you know. Uh, we just got to be vigilant and we got to keep pushing and, and do things in decency and in order. As long as we do things in decency and order, I think we'll be okay. Tensions were higher at the Columbia Police Department in downtown Columbia, where protesters yelled at law enforcement guarding the building, and you can hear water bottles and other items hitting officers and protesters. Later, shots were fired, police cars were set ablaze, and a mob attacked officers trying to protect a person. A 6 p.m. curfew was put into effect, and things continued to escalate in the nearby Vista, a vibrant dining and shopping district that law enforcement now had to systematically clear for the next three hours. The group that's here now has nothing to do with the group that came out and stood at that state house and that sun and peacefully protested. This is a different group. They're one, this group here is not going to be allowed to take over Columbia. There were extremely volatile moments, including this scene on Assembly Street. Law enforcement continued to clear the area into the evening using tear gas and other methods to get people out of the vista and enforce the curfew. And calm was eventually restored in Columbia, while destruction continued in Charleston. However, throughout the remainder of the week, protests across the state continued to be peaceful as the state and nation seek a way forward. Now join me is Republican Senator Tim Scott to discuss the events facing our state and our country this week. Senator, thanks for joining me. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Senator, I want to talk about uh, several things, but first, really want to just bring this back to George Floyd, uh, the man who was killed in Minneapolis when a police officer knelt on his neck for more than eight minutes. I want to ask you about when you saw that video, what your thoughts were. Uh, just, just tell me how you felt when you saw that video for the first time. I was sick to my stomach. I could not believe that I was once again watching the uh, death of an African-American male at the hand of a law enforcement officer, unfortunately. My first images was just thinking back of Walter Scott running away from the law enforcement officer that ultimately shot him five times in the back and uh, how little we believed the situation until we saw the situation and how often we are uh, confronted with the fact that while the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of law enforcement officers are good people doing their jobs, wanting to go home to their families, there's, there's just too many incidents that suggest and reinforces the narrative that have played out for the last four plus decades of my life that there seems to be more aggression and frankly more violence against African Americans in that, that exchange. Mm -hmm. 
And when you talk about little has been done, when, except without the cha without the uh, evidence of video, what does that say about where we are? And that maybe that uh, you know a black man's word is not worth as much as someone else's word unless there's video to back it up and to say, hey, no, he didn't do anything wrong. He was just out for a run, for example. Well, you obviously talk about Mr. Arbery. That is pretty clear that he was just jogging down the street in one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, two guys in a pickup truck shot him dead. And six weeks later, we didn't know about it because uh, the uh, facts were they had a video, but the video was kept private, it seems. And the uh, guy, who, the, the murderer, was a former police officer who worked for the DA, and the relationship seemed to play a very significant role in that situation. I'd also say that the uh, situation in the New York City Park is really important for us to look at. They call her Central Park Karen, or whatever they call her. Uh, having the instinct that she could call the police and simply say that an African-American man was threatening her life gave her the kind of power and authority that makes most black men shudder uh, and shake because they know that when the law enforcement officer shows up in that situation, a binary choice, uh, he is going to be in danger and she is not. Mm -hmm. How does that change then? How do we fundamentally change those kinds of situations? Because that's what it seems like is really at the root of a lot of this, a lot of these situations. It's just uh, a white person's word against a black person's word, and it, and it seems like the white person's word still has more weight. Well, there, I mean, it, the answer is it does, and unfortunately, that's the case in the vast majority of the time, uh, especially with with uh, the where it matters the most injustice. And so, I think the short answer is we have to have. Uh, more people talking about this issue at the highest levels. We have to have better training for our law enforcement officers at the highest level. We actually need uh, not more legislation, though that might be helpful, but the real thing we need is to investigate the heart. And the only way you do that is one person at a time. And frankly, the way that we get there is for both sides of the debate to understand their power or the lack thereof in the interactions and that takes a long-term strategy, not a meeting or two, not a lunch or two, not just well-wishing, but literally making a commitment to walk in someone else's uh, footsteps for several months so that you can have an appreciation for their worldview. That, that, that requires black folks to do that with cops, for uh, law enforcement officers to do that with black folks, for people of good conscience to do it with each other, especially with people who don't look like them. Mm -hmm. So would you say that the protests right now, the peaceful protests as they are, are accomplishing at least some of that or getting that, that dialogue to more to the forefront? Because these protests are something we really haven't seen, you know, it's not only nationwide, but worldwide essentially. Yeah, there's no doubt that talking to my friends uh, in the majority community who have called me and texted me and said, what can I do, what they c keep telling me is that the image, the video of George Floyd really asking for his mother at the end was hard to watch. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, uh, they, 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 they saw something they had never seen before. Uh, and they wanted to do something. And my, my short answer is uh, silence is not an answer. It's not an approach. And I'm thankful that they are calling and asking for ways to make a difference. It's recognizing that you have the power to be intentional about the change that is necessary. And if you use that power for change, it will happen. It won't come from just the voices of the oppressed. It will come from those folks who have the freedom to see the freedom to, 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 to deny and to, to live their lives and to be good people, as we would, we, we would say it. But when those good people decide to become intentional about their actions and their interactions and their relationships, this world will change. And it helps to have that silent, I should say nonviolent protesters showing us the way. It reminds me of John Lewis uh, in uh, the 60s, having served with John Lewis gave me a perspective that you can't read about, walking in his office and talking to a living legend. Him telling me, uh, John saying to Tim, uh, don't get bitter. Don't let the poison fill your heart. Don't be distracted by people who tell you that you should be uh, outraged. He said, harness that potential and make it productive. 
Uh, what a powerful lesson for me. Mm -hmm. Basically saying, don't destroy things, don't riot, but just turn that anger into something productive because unfortunately it seems like we've been losing a little bit of the dialogue of this conversation because of destruction now taking over the news a little bit more than the message. Yeah, there's no doubt. The negative news sells better than positive news. So the, the, the uh, bottom protesters uh, that may be in the thousands while the, the non-bottom protesters are in the tens of thousands those smaller groups are getting far more attention because it becomes newsworthy when the protests turn violent. It's, it's also newsworthy when it doesn't. But the coverage is always going to focus on the outlier more than it does the, the norm. And thankfully, the norm, the nonviolent protesters, have changed this country significantly over the last 50 years. That's one of the reasons why I point out John Lewis, because his willingness to be beaten to within an inch of his life by law enforcement at the Pettus Bridge is one of the reasons why I have the freedom and, and, and the opportunity to run for public office uh, in our state. So there's a lot that has changed because of the nonviolent protesters. And if we continue to watch their actions, it points us to the future. The selfish, violent protesters, I don't consider them protesters. They're agitators, they are distractors, and they're detracting from George Floyd's death. That should be the beginning of the conversation and not this, just a, a footnote. And with switching to the federal response and looking at the president, uh, do you feel like the president is doing enough to quell the situation in America? Do you think he's helping bring people together, or what kind of suggestions do you have for the president at this point in time? Well, I, I, I have always had the good fortune of talking to the president personally and directly, and so I, I give him my, my advice and don't have to necessarily do it uh, in, in an interview. What I have told the president is that it's really important for him to speak out on behalf of George Floyd and George Floyd's family. Uh, I like when he starts tweeting about uh, justice for the Floyd family, justice for George Floyd. Uh, I, I appreciate his questions about the three officers that have been recently uh, arrested. Uh, before they were arrested, he was uh, telling me that, they're, that those three need to be held accountable just like the, the person who had the knee on the neck. So uh, the president's response, I think, continues to evolve, and I think for the most part it, it evolves in the right direction. And he, uh, he has some used some divisive language, which you've taken some umbrage to. And he's also, uh, they had to clear out peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square the other day. I'm just wondering, uh, do you think that's the right message to be sending to do a photo op at this point? Uh, we've also even heard from former Defense Secretary Jim Mattis about just his real big concerns about the president uh, leading the country at this point. Yeah, the, I take the, the I take the president at his word when he said that he had no idea what they did in order to create the path for him to walk across. Uh, I think he was being sincere with that, uh, with, that with that information. So uh, his, his goal, his desire to to bring the country together is one of the things I've emphasized as well, and I I hope he continues along that path. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the statement from? from General Mattis talking about Donald Trump as the first president in my lifetime who does not try to unite the American people, does not even pretend to try. Do you feel that's an accurate representation? Yeah, I guess General Mattis and I know two different Donald Trumps based on that, 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 those comments. There's no doubt that the president's uh, love language is probably not words of encouragement all the time. It maybe it's acts of service. It's perhaps when you look at the legislative accomplishments that we've had, mm -hmm. whether it's support for uh, historically black colleges and universities, whether it's research on sickle cell anemia, whether it's opportunity zones, whether it's quality education, um, whether it's help for heirs property. The agenda that he has pushed and signed into law have been very helpful to the minority communities. Uh, so some of the tweets, uh, I think, perhaps reflect um, his his counter-puncher nature, and uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why when I've spoken out about the need for more constructive dialogue, I, I have I've pointed to those. But it's important for us to, to continue to look for ways to work together. It's my responsibility to get things done, and I am thankful that when I call the president with a specific ask for underrepresented communities, whether that's rural South Carolina or inner city uh, America, he says, let's have that conversation, and we typically make progress together. 
And, and Senator, with about a minute left here, I just want to ask you kind of a big question. You know, we're, how do we, I want to know how we navigate this crossroads we're at, it seems like, in America. Uh, you know, we're, we have these protests going on. There's racial injustice continuing. Uh, we have an ongoing pandemic, we, you know, an imminent recession. And then these, these racial and economic disparities have really been brought to light even more so because of this pandemic. How do you see us moving forward? What needs to be done? How will you lead during this difficult time going forward? Well, I, I've uh, made several recommendations to the administration, and I, I've seen that we've, we're starting to put some skin on the bones. One of the things I, I think about when it comes to health care, when it comes to opportunities in the workforce, uh, as, as well as the ability to provide more education, connectivity is a big issue. I'm pushing the envelope around uh, broadband because I think it's really an important part of connection. If you want to be able to see your doctor, you're in rural South Carolina, uh, it's important to have broadband connections. If you want to educate your child because you can't send him, send him or her back to school, broadband is important. If you want to look for a way to telework, and 80% of African Americans and Hispanics cannot telework, uh, you need to have broadband uh, and connectivity. The other thing I've talked about is the importance of telemedicine as well as technology. Uh, on, on the entrepreneurial front, I talk about, I spoke with him about access to capital, uh, training and, and resourcing so that we have more small businesses, mm -hmm. uh, frankly, in rural America as well as the inner cities. I think what I've learned is that whether you're an inner city kid or a, a rural kid, maybe of a different color, you face some of the same challenges, some of the same roadblocks. And so when we start seeing this nation as, as a single nation under God and indivisible, I think we start making a lot of progress. So my question is, what can I do? The answer is be intentional about your approach to bridging the gap by understanding communities that you are not from. Um, fortunately, as an African-American Republican, also known as a unicorn, I have a chance to understand the world from two very different vantage points at times. Very good. Senator Tim Scott, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, sir. And joining me now to discuss the state of affairs facing Columbia is Mayor Steve Benjamin. Mayor, thanks for joining us. Well, Kevin, thank you for having me. So, Mayor, uh, before we get into a lot of these, the situation that happened over this past week, I just want to get your thoughts on how you felt when you saw the death of George Floyd on that videotape at the hands of that white police officer. Just what were your emotions? What were your thoughts when you saw that uh, happening? I've... Um... The last several months, to be honest with you, have been incredibly painful, I think, for a number of people. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little older than you. Um, I'm, I'm officially 50 now. Uh, so watching the disparate impact of, 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 the, of the pandemic on, on, on communities of color, uh, watch, watching um, older I men may suffer from hypertension or diabetes or what have you, you, you obviously, if, if you're an empathetic individual, you sit, you stand in that place, and it's been difficult emotionally. Obviously, and unlike me, I have family and loved ones around me. Some people are suffering in isolation. To compound that with literally seeing a man have a life choked out of him, um, I, I, I wept. I wept several times last week. My wife gave me uh, space to do so. Uh, I got my music. You know, a couple of nights, I got me a glass of wine, and. Um, I wept. I wept, I wept uh, for um, George Floyd and his family. I wept for humanity. Uh, I wept for whatever experiences uh, those officers might have had that, that allowed them to disconnect themselves with the fact that another child of God was there beneath that knee. And I wept. It. I, I, and I, I've been hard pressed to find a man or woman, at least in my in my fairly wide circle of. of, of influence and, and, and um, relationships, that wasn't heartbroken. And, uh, and a lot of us still are. I, I, I think America, in many respects, is going to do a, um, a significant emotional upheaval as a result of the, the vivid display of cruelty and inhumanity uh, in, in Minneapolis. And we've got to make sure we, we, we harness that energy towards actually uh, doing some good. Mm -hmm. And we did see some of that positive energy at play on Saturday at the Statehouse. We saw thousands of people, black and white, gathered 
just to uh, display that emotion that you're talking about, so many people share that same emotion, that feeling of uh, seeing the George Floyd dying, that they felt they needed to do something. They went out and protested, and they unified. What were your thoughts when you saw those peaceful protests happening? We'll talk about other things that happened that day, but when you just saw this initial peaceful protest, uh, was that hopeful to you? Were you ever thinking that maybe things could spiral, or was it just maybe this time we're going to keep it peaceful, and even though there might be a lot of anger and emotion, people are going to you're going to stick to using their words instead of, uh, you know, destructive force. Sure. I had my first uh, rally and protest at the State House when I was, gosh, I was 18 years old, so 32 years ago. Um, I'm, the, I'm a huge believer that, uh, that active protests, that seeking redress um, for your grievances from your government is is literally in the DNA of the of the of the United States of America. You know, if you if you want to take a sanitized version and go back to the Boston Tea Party um, and and the debates around taxation without representation, throughout the course of the history of this great country, the ability for men and women and 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 and, and children, for that matter, to petition their government um, to uh, have the right to the free assembly, free speech. Um, it, it's, it, it, it is sacrosanct as to who we are as a, as a uh, country. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I've, I've been to rallies as, as a public official, as mayor, I've been as a cabinet secretary, I've been as law enforcement, but I started there as a protester. And um, um, I'm, I'm always encouraged, uh, particularly when I hear younger voices helping to shape the debate. Um, I think last week, um, immediately leading up to the Saturday protest, um, again, the the, uh, the the chorus of voices that we began to hear, some that we'd never heard from before, as you talk about issues of uh, uh, of social justice or, or racial inequality, were chiming in, and that was very encouraging. We, had, I, I was feel felt that we had a moment where where there was this great synchronicity, um, and um, that was manifesting itself in Saturday, and then Saturday afternoon happened. Mm -hmm. And did that get overshadowed? I mean, do you feel like that the, the positivity got lost because of the destruction? You had cop cars burning, you had shots fired. Uh, what was it like that day for you, what you were witnessing, and seeing that such a change from earlier in the day? It was a, it was a, very, it was a very painful moment, very painful moment. I, I, I'd come out to the peaceful march uh, earlier. I came out and passed out water and masks. I just try to remember, remind everyone that we were indeed still in the middle of a, of a, of a pandemic. Uh, and uh, that we need to do whatever we could to be socially responsible, socially social distance, and, and if you couldn't, at very least, wear some type of protective uh, face face wear. So I passed out um, hundreds of masks and, and, and um, uh, at least dozens of bottles of, of water. The um, uh, and then I, I went home, went, went to actually spend some time with my family, and I watched as the as the protest. Um, uh, then migrated over to the police department and came right back downtown yeah. and, and make sure that I was able to um, help our chief of police and the other assembled law enforcement officers do their do their jobs and give them um, civilian leadership. That's not law enforcement uh, leadership. And um, it was heartbreaking. I, I wish I wish I could uh, find more colorful, uh, vivid words um, to articulate, but it, but it was heartbreaking. You know, when you live in a city like um, all, some of us have been here. Uh, for just maybe a few months, others have been here the entirety of our adult lives, and my families have been here for some time. Very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. We're blessed to represent, you know, um, people from every one of the 194 sovereign nations of the world live here in, in Columbia, in the metropolitan area. I've been blessed to live in the city. The city's given me everything I have from a beautiful the family and everything else. So to, to the watch that manifestation of that pain and hurt and suffering turn into violence, mm -hmm. um, it, it was heartbreaking, if I had to use one word. Do you think police used the right tactics? We have about two minutes left, Mayor. I just want to get your thoughts on how the, the police broke up crowds using certain dispersal methods. Do you think that was appropriate? Uh, did you give them any special instructions to do any, maybe give more latitude to protesters? Or what was it like to, to have that, those calls being made? The officers made the officers made a lot of tough calls, um, you know, in, in in action in which there were there was literally, as you mentioned, uh, not not just this wasn't just graffiti. You were talking about police cars burning, people being assaulted, uh, personal property damage, uh, commercial property damage, and as that was going on, there were no arrests. I mean, and eventually, I made the call to call for the 6 p.m. curfew, 
and, 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 and ask them to disperse the crowds. Um, I, I wish I could say everything was done perfectly. It wasn't. Um, we don't live in a perfect world. Um, but I, I do believe that uh, the men and women in law enforcement did the very best job they could under very difficult circumstances. And the governor was on a conference call with the president and other governors talking about, uh, the president was talking about uh, the need to be more dominant to really help crack down on on these situations. I think he was actually alluding to more of the bad actors. Uh, the governor, our governor, did say that, you know, we did see improvement in Charleston. They started using the National Guard on Sunday evening and they didn't really have any incidents. Do you see that as something necessary to happen here in, in Columbia? Absolutely not. No, we don't. We don't. We don't need the military on the streets of Columbia, and um, I won't speak to the president or the uh, or the governor's position on, on the issue. Um, I heard the governor respond to some things the president said, but on on the tone and tenor and the substance of the, of the engagement we've heard from the president so far, um, I disagree with it. And Mayor, we have about a minute left. Just want to get your thoughts on what we need to do now. I saw you talking to some protesters this week. Things have calmed down this week. Uh, there you know, will be more protests in the future. What are you hearing from these protesters and what are you doing? I know you've, you've actually accomplished some things in your tenure uh, to address some of these inequalities, but what, what, what are they saying to you? We have made a commitment in Colombia to engage in 21st century policing and to change the way that we build a more accountable police department, transparent police department that has active citizen engagement and the best law enforcement that we can have. Uh, the engagement with these young people, I've been impressed with them. Very impressed with, it, with, with, with their ideas. Uh, we are doing a lot of things that they've always, they're always recommending, uh, but there's always room for improvement. So we've made a commitment that we're going to continue to work in dialogue on making um, making public safety better here in Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Got you. Thank you very much, Mayor, for joining us. You take care. Thank you. To stay up to date on South Carolina news, check out the South Carolina Lead podcast. You can find it wherever you find podcasts and SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.